My last video was about fixed point numbers, how you do fixed point arithmetic, and really it was an introduction to this video, which is about floating point numbers. How do computers store floating point numbers? Well, that's what we're gonna look at today. So if you wanna find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so in this video, we're gonna see why floating point numbers float like a butterfly, but sting like a bee. They have a downside, which we're gonna look at. Okay, so just a quick recap, what are floating point numbers? If you look at some of these decimal numbers, 1.234, 62.98, and so on, you can see that the decimal point is in a different position. The number of digits after the point changes. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's one, uh, and so on. So notice that the decimal places is different in each case. The point isn't in the same place. It seems to jump around to float. Now, just to compare that with fixed point numbers, which of course was the subject of the previous video, in fixed point numbers, it's always the same precision. The dot doesn't move, the point doesn't move. 1.234, three decimal places. 62.980, three decimal places. There, what, 0, 0, 0, three decimal places, uh, and so on. All the above numbers have three decimal places of precision, always, and it's fixed. So before we go on more about floating point numbers, we do need to mention a bit about a thing called binary fractions. Now, you know what binary is, of course, ones and zeros, base two, we normally deal in base 10, but in base two, which is what computers deal in, on and off. So when you have a binary number, you have each value, rather than the units, the tens, the hundreds, the thousands, as we would in base 10, it's one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 28, and so on. So if you want to do a number 17, you have one lot of 16, and then a one, and that will give you 17. Now, binary fractions go in the other direction, so after the decimal point. So you still have one, position one, position two, position three, and so on, but now, rather than being one, two, four, eight, so it's doubling, now it halves, so it's half, a quarter, an eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty-tooth, one hundred and sixty-fourth, and so on. So going away from the decimal point, every bit, one or zero, defines part of a fraction, halving itself each time as it goes through each position. So here are some examples of binary fractions. As I said, you've got half, quarter, and so on. And what you do here, if you, if you want 0 0.75, well, you take one half and one quarter, one, one, and then the rest of zeros, so that gives you 0 0.75. If you want 0 0.375, well, then you have no halves, but you do have a quarter, and you do have an eighth, and the rest of the stuff is empty. So it's 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. And then if you want 0 0.515625, well, how do you get that? Well, it's just 0 0.5. So you can definitely have a one in there at uh, the, uh, the first bit, the 0 0.5. And then you can have 0, 0, 0, 0, and then one. And when you add those together, you get 0 0.515625, like that. But of course, there are other numbers you might want to. So if you have 0 0.8, well, you're going to need a, a 0 0.5. You're going to need a 0 0.25. That gets you close. Uh, and then we don't need a 0 0.125, we don't need a 0 0.0625, but we will add in a 0 0.3125 and a 0 0.15625. And then, in fact, it goes on. It's just like when you try to divide one by three in decimal, you get 0 0.33333333 recurring. Here in binary, this number doesn't end. It just keeps on going. There's a repeating pattern in this case, 1100, 1100, 1100, and it just goes on uh, for, for infinity. So not all numbers can be precisely encoded into a binary fraction. And that's important. This is where the sting in the tail starts to come about for binary fractions and for floating point numbers. So here are, is a list of the first 24 binary fractions, as we showed here, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.125, all the way up for 24 of them until you get this 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5, 9, 6, 0, 4, and so on. So that's the first 24. Why 24? Well, that's actually the number that gets used when we're dealing with 32-bit uh, floating point numbers, which we'll talk about in a moment. So how do computers store floating point numbers? With fixed point numbers, even though it's hard coded, there's a scaling factor. So if you remember from the last video, you could be dealing with everything by a scaling of 10 or a scaling of 100. And that's predefined with floating point numbers because it's not predefined that the, the point floats, then the scaling needs to be incorporated into the format. So part of it is the exponent, which tells you how much you need to multiply it to the left or to the right. So a floating point number in general has three parts to it. The sign, is it positive or negative? The exponent, 
and then this fraction that we've just been talking about. And there is a standard called the IEEE 754, standard for floating point arithmetic. It was invented in 1985, standardizing on the way that a computer should represent a floating point number in binary. Okay, and it's used in modern processes, including the x86, 8664, uh, ARCH32 for ARM32, ARM64, RISC-V, and so on. Now, when you write a program in C, what you're actually doing is you're using an IEEE 754 representation of a floating point number. So if you use single precision, which is generally called a float in C, then that's a 32-bit by a uh, floating point number. If you use a, a double, then that's a 64-bit floating point number. And you can also use a long double, uh, which is the binary format that occupies at least 79 bits uh, and has a precision of at least 64 bits. Now, why are we saying at least? Because obviously if you're storing up to 80 bits, you could go up to you know 127 bits, 128 bits, but it really does depend on the C standard, the C compiler, and the architecture of the processor. It's really the x86 that kind of uh, gave us this kind of idea of these 79, 80 bits that are used for these uh, longer uh, floating point numbers. Okay, so here is an example of an IEEE 754 floating bit number. You've got these three distinct sections here that I've put in different colors. So there's one bit for the sine bit, plus or minus. The exponent is eight bits, and the fraction is another 23 bits. So in this case, the sine is zero, that means it's positive. The exponent is uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, so that's 124. And then the fraction is 0, 1, and the rest zero is that actually means, as we just saw, 0 0.25 when we looked at the binary fractions a moment ago. So how does that get turned into a floating point number? Well, ignoring the sign, because that's really just a case of whether it's positive or negative. It's 2 to the power of the exponent minus 127, so the exponent minus 127. So if this was 128, it would be 1. If this was 126, it would be minus 1. So you can have 2 to the power of 1, or 2 to the power of minus 1, or 2 to the power of 2, or 2 to the power of minus 2, and so on. And then you multiply that number by 1 point, and then the fraction. Okay, so it's not just the fraction, it's 1 point, and then the fraction. So in our case, it's 124 minus 127 is minus 3. So that's actually 0.125. And then the fraction part, one point fraction is 1.25. So then the way you make the float is like this. It's 1.25 multiplied by 0 0.125, which is 0 0.15625. Or you could say it's 1.25 divided by 2, divided by 2, and then divided by 2 again, because it's 2 to the power of minus 3. Or in fact, 2 to the power of 3 is 8, so it becomes 1.25 divided by 2. Eight. So there are different ways of looking at it there, depending on whether you want to do multiplication or division. Now let's look at some other numbers. So 0 0.12, there's the binary representation of it with the exponent and the fraction. Okay, we know it's positive. The exponent is um, minus 4, which would be the same as dividing by 16. And then the fraction part, notice there's lots of 1s and zeros here. So you look at here, they're all like half plus 0.25 plus 0.12. And then there's a whole load of them here that you use. And uh, when you add that up, you get 1.919999957 and so on. So that's what that fraction part is. So the exponent is the same as 0 0.0625 or dividing by 16. And when you put that all together, you get 0 0.1199999973177908. So it's not quite 0 0.12 it's actually 0 0.1199999, basically. So here we can see an example of where there is a, an error difference in actually the number that you wanted and the number that's actually stored inside of the float. Let's look at another one, 12.334. That's the binary representation of it. Okay, it's positive. Expo is three multiplied by eight. There's all the fraction part that you add up together. So therefore, it's 1.54174 and so on. Okay, multiply by 8. So when you take 1.54174 and so on, multiply it, you get 12.3339996 and so on. So it's not quite, again, 12.334. It's 12.3339. So again, a very slight difference between what you wanted to store and what is actually stored. And let's go for a more complicated one to one point zero zero nine zero zero three. Well, there's the binary representation. The exponent is six. There's the fraction part. And so you take one point eight nine oh seven six five. So on, you multiply it by sixty four and you get 
121.0090026854. So again, it's very close, but it's not exactly what you were trying to store. And this can lead to some floating point uh, errors. Now, if you're dealing with, let's say, currency, then rounding up to two decimal places is going to be okay, probably. If you're dealing with 3D graphics, well, you're only going to hit a pixel. So whether it hits that pixel or not hits that pixel is easy enough to do there. But if you are doing some very sophisticated, uh, high level, high precision maths, then this can be a problem. Now, floating point numbers can also store whole numbers, integers. So for example, 42, but it will be 0 0.0 because it's a floating uh, point number. But as they get larger, they decrease in precision. So just like as you had more decimal places and you weren't quite hitting the same thing, floats are exactly the same in the other direction. As they get bigger, what you're storing is not actually quite what you want. Now you can store from minus 16777216 to positive 16777216 accurately, and you'll get exactly that number stored inside of the float. But if you write a C program, and you can try and do this, that has a float with that value, and then you increment it, so F++, then it won't increment. It will stick at 16777216, so it will stick there, and you can increment it a million times. It will just stick there, so it will stop incrementing. So that's an interesting thing to note about C. You can't increment a float beyond a certain point. And why is that? Well, here's the binary representation of it. And so we know it's positive. Now, here's the first thing. The exponent is 24. Now, we know there are only 23 bits here. So whatever happens, we're running off the end of these number of bits. If we start shifting everything, there's not enough bits. So that's why at this 24 and then it all being zeros, well, that's okay because you can shift beyond zero and it's still zero. So that's okay. But after this, you're not going to be able to do it any further. And so the fraction part is just one, 1 1.0. And so uh, when you multiply that out, you get 16777216. Now you can still assign things to a float. So if you've got a bigger number than that previous one, and then you then cast it to a float, it will work. You can't increment that one, but you can, add, you can put a, a result into it and it will try its best to store the number. So you can store up to 33554432 within plus or minus one. So for example, if you store, if you, put into a float 33554429.0, it would actually store 33554428, so it would be out by one. Okay, and uh, here, here the precision gets less and less after this number. So you can store up to two to the power of 127 in size, it's a big number, but with errors in precision, and by the time you get up to that end, the errors are measured in the billions. Now, I wrote a little program called decode IEEE 754.c. It's a pro C program that actually takes the float out of memory and starts to look at those ones and zeros to try to decode it rather than just saying to C, you know, print a float. Actually, it wants to look at those numbers. OK, so it uses fixed point numbers to calculate the floating point numbers. It's a work in process, it's a hack. I just threw it together just to help me understand floating point numbers and, and IEEE 754, and hopefully it will be useful to you as well. You need to change the precision manually because it's using fixed point numbers. If you're dealing with big numbers rather than small numbers, you need to change that in the code so it will work. It's in my GitHub repository. Just search for Gary Explains GitHub. One final thing before I close, and that is there is also an FP8. So we were talking about FP32, FP64, then there was a kind of that 79-bit version, um, even bigger than that. And there's also an FP8. So NVIDIA, ARM and Intel have jointly authored a white paper called FP8 Formats for Deep Learning, describing an 8-bit floating point specification. It provides a common format, accelerates AI development by optimizing memory usage, and works for both AI training and inference. It turns out that even having that kind of pretty bad precision on those floating point numbers actually works okay when it, when it comes to the weights and so on that are inside of the uh, neural network. And uh, so there are three different versions. There's the five bit exponent version, the four bit exponent version, and the three bit exponent version. Uh, and this is now being used by, as I say, Nvidia, ARM and Intel uh, to try to see if they can squeeze these huge neural networks into smaller amounts of memory without losing too much of the, uh, the the quality of the neural network. Okay, that's it, my name's Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. If you like these kind of videos, why not stick around by subscribing to the channel? Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.